Okay, so um, all right. So we'll just um, start with some some introductions. Um, Where this is our monthly women's empowerment workshop from Women on the Move Network, and we're very happy to have you all with us. Um, I think we have um, a couple of people that we'd like to, why don't we just all each say who we are and introduce ourselves and then we will start our presentation. So um, the, Diane, would you, yeah. like, it, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, if I can remember who I am, yeah. <laughs> My name is Diane Gunther. I uh, am a resident of Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, I'm one of the board members of Women on the Move. And I am very excited tonight because after the meeting, uh, we're going, my son-in-law is a football coach and their uh, team is in the CIF um, playoff for their division. And his son, um, his school the football team, which he is a football player too, is in also in the CIF playoffs. So they're playing all the way in Venice um, tonight in their division. So, so you're going all the way to Venice to see? No, the game? no, no. We're going to go to Chris's game, my son-in-law's game. Oh, okay. Player tonight, and and Noah should be home. Uh, at Etiwanda on uh, next Friday when they they and they will win tonight. Okay. Uh, All right. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay. So Mila, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi everyone. My name is Mila Afshar. I'm an attorney, um, and I work with Miss Azizi at the office in Rancho Cucamonga. I live in Laguna Niguel. And I'm a member of um, Women on the Move, and I love being part of this. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Edie? I'm Edie. I live in Ontario since before there was there. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was I, a, since God was a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I've been following along with uh, Women on the Move for, uh, since we started it, so... Um, and, and I'm excited about tonight. I just, I just think that every, every meeting that we have gets better and better, and um, that's why I'm excited about it. Good. Okay. Ziba, can you introduce yourself from your car? <laughs> I don't know. She's doing something. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't realize she's actually unmuted. Ziba, you're you're not muted. You can you can go for it. Oh, oh, she's disappeared. No, she's oh, she's there. She's there. That's she's there. Signing on. There's there's Sohela. Oh look, she has a green background. It's supposed to okay, be so, so let's let's move on and have Kitty introduce herself. <laughs> well, I've already been introduced. My name is Kitty. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> Hi, Kitty. Hi, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the moment, but I am really completely a California person. So it's just wonderful to be with you and learn from you and smile with you, and I can share what you what I learned from you, I can share with my granddaughters and my great granddaughters and my great great granddaughters. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, Hela. Yes, ma'am. How uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us how was your exam? Hello, yes, uh, this is Sohela Azizi. Uh, for those of you who, I, I don't even know how many people we have here, but um, for those friends who may be here for the first time, 
I'm a woman on the move. I'm on the board of the women on the move, and I just moved from one Zoom to another. You know, <laughs> there was transportation, we would travel places. Now we're just Zooming in and out of meetings. Uh, so this would be the second Zoom of the day, and there's yet one to come. So just looking forward to our presenters, to, uh, to hearing our presenter and the presentation today. Okay. Let's see everyone here. Great to be here. Andrea? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Andrea Morua. I am the social marketing director for all things uh, Sohela Zizi. Uh, I do volunteer uh, and provide all my services with, with uh, Women on the Move, among other nonprofit organizations. Um, uh, excited to see what we have today for uh, joining us. Okay. And so... Um, now we will meet our, our presenter, and sh uh, I, once you introduce yourself, you may go, well, I don't know about Ziba. Is Ziba going to be able to say anything? If you can hear me, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I'm, yes. I'm sorry, I'm driving uh, all the way from Moreno Valley. I certainly didn't want to miss this session. So if you excuse me, I will drive and I have to have my eyes on the road, okay. <laughs> but ears with you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so grateful for the arrangement. Thank you. Thank you, Ziba. All right. So Natalie, it's your turn and the floor is yours. Thank so you so much. First off, I want to thank you all for inviting me to take part today and to give a presentation. My name is Natalie Boyum. I'm the president and founder of the Defeating Epilepsy Foundation. We're a 501c3 here in Rancho Cucamonga, and our mission is to provide the advocacy and educational resources needed to the epilepsy community and our society. So I'm briefly going to explain what epilepsy is today share a little bit about my life dealing with a neurological disorder and really how important it is going to be to um, help others in this situation. So. Can everyone see the presentation okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. So briefly about me, I'm a social entrepreneur and advocate for people with epilepsy. My educational background, I have a master's in business administration from the University of Redlands with a focus in strategic management and planning, which I do everything to use to my full advantage to educate not just people who have epilepsy, but people outside the epilepsy community about what it is so that we can work towards goals of um, people not being afraid of those who have seizures to help create better educational and economic opportunities for them, as well as them having um, being treated more fairly, whether it's in a social environment, in the healthcare system, just working towards improving their quality of life. So epilepsy is a neurological disorder that results in someone having seizures. Individuals are diagnosed with epilepsy when they have had two or more unprovoked seizures. And what the difference between unprovoked and provoked is when doctors, for example, are trying to figure out what area of the brain that a seizure is coming from, they will have patients go into what's called an epilepsy mounting unit, and they may do things to trigger a seizure, such as taking off a medication, strobe lights, certain sounds, things that will stress or trigger something where they intentionally caused it to see what they can do to help the patient. In this situation, a lot of times the cause of it is unknown and is trying to figure out what is causing it so that they can stop it. The complexity of epilepsy is there are over 40 different types of epilepsy and each case is different. So with my health, I have, um, I have epilepsy due to a traumatic brain injury and I'm controlled with medication, but the medication that keeps me functioning and healthy could easily kill another person. So it can depend on genetics. It could depend on so many factors of what it takes to get that person um, healthy. There's no um, black or white situation with this type of condition. 
and epilepsy can be caused by genetic mutations in the brain, head trauma, tumors, stroke, any type of brain deformation, deformation or abnormality, infections like um, meningitis, any prenatal injuries or developmental disorders can also um, lead to someone having epilepsy. So according to the Mayo Clinic, a seizure is a sudden, uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. It can cause changes in behavior, movements or feelings, and in levels of consciousness. There are many different types of seizures. The most known ones are tonic-clonic, or used to be referred to as grandma, and absent seizures, who, which used to be referred to as petty mal. So seizures can last anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. And if a seizure lasts for more than five minutes or continues to repeat, then it is necessary to seek medical attention. So the brain is made of different lobes and each one is affected differently by epilepsy. And this is where the complexity can come in for the condition because depending what area the brain is affected will result on how a person reacts when they're having a seizure. So our frontal lobes are responsible for our speech, motor skills, forming memories, and our personality. So some people who have frontal lobe epilepsy when they're having seizures may um, become assertive. They may be a little more impulsive. It could be uncomfortable for some people to be around. They may lose consciousness completely. There's very different reactions they can have. The parietal lobe is responsible for processing somatic senses, including touch, pressure, pain, heat, cold and tension. It is involved with language, writing, and math skills. The occipital lobe is responsible for processing external stimuli and assigning meaning to visual perceptions. This can include assessing distance, size, depth, color, object movement, mapping, and reading. And the temporal lobe is responsible for emotion, short-term memory, and language. So I was diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of two due to a traumatic brain injury. And my first medication I was put on was phenobarbital, which is a very strong barbiturate to control my seizures. I was on 90 milligrams a day, which is three times the adult dosage. So my childhood is a very, very big blur. And where I was not so much stressful for me as a child, but for my family is back in the 80s, you didn't question really what the doctor wanted. It's do as I said, just follow orders, and we keep someone healthy. Where my doctor did a great disservice to my parents and my family is being over medicated, it was very difficult for me to follow instructions. I was exhausted being on this medication. I also was very hypersensitive. So if I became frustrated, I may become angry and the next moment break down. I came off the best way to describe it as a difficult child, where really my parents were not given any types of skills or tools to help get around that. No, take her to a child psychologist, try these sort of exercises, nothing. It was give her her medicine, she has a seizure, take her to the hospital which really for somebody who's dealing with a sick child, no parent should be left up in the air like that. And so many children who battle epilepsy, as well as other neurological and developmental disorders, they're heavily, heavily medicated, which reduces their quality of life. It is why um, I, I'm not anti-medication. I'm alive because of medication. But I'm one thing I'm a very fierce advocate about is people, children or adults, I feel we need to look at all the tools that are available to help somebody with their quality of life and well-being. Medication, it's not a magic pill. It cannot make the problem go away. It is a tool that can help control the problem. But when it comes to quality of life, with a lot of the side effects, it can cause more frustration than help in a lot of situations, sadly. So growing up with epilepsy was very difficult because of the over-medication and also the um, side effects that I received from it. Um, complications that I had, especially as a teenager, such as anxiety and depression, really were not addressed. 
And at that time, there were no such thing as care plans being made together by doctors, as I stated in the 1980s. It was pretty much the doctor put together a plan and you followed it. There was no contributing to the plan and helping to um, have a meeting of the minds together. So as a child, I did very good in school, despite being over-medicated. And I think a lot of that had to do with, because of being over-medicated and it was hard to socialize, I had to find passions to keep myself healthy and productive. So I developed a passion for music and art. I taught myself how to play a number of instruments. I loved painting. I loved doing a lot of things that being isolated because of a lot of the things I really would love to do that the typical child was able to, because of not being able to do it, I had to find happiness in other ways. And to deal with isolation, depression, um, along with teaching myself to play instruments, I wrote my own music. I built Lego cities and I would garden and do needlepoint with my grandmother. I found ways to um, be able to connect to myself and to others without allowing epilepsy to overcome me. The biggest thing that I think a lot of people need to realize when it comes to children who have chronic illnesses is the impact it has on families. And it impacts in so many ways. It's not just um, being there to see that they have a sick child. It physically, emotionally, mentally, financially impacts all the family members in one way or another. And families, when they are dealing with a sick child or a sick loved one, it's stressful to them and they all deal with the stress in a different way. My mother's family was very supportive and understanding. They pretty much were ready to do whatever it took to help me to be happy and healthy. My father's family had the same mentality, but in a very different way. My mother's or my father's family is um, Mediterranean Middle Eastern descent and they escaped the Middle East out of a war zone. So bringing that kind of trauma with them of fleeing because of being the wrong faith. They were, they had a very strong work ethic and they were very private and did not want others to know what went on within the family. It was just work and make a living and survive and move forward. So when I became very sick, both of my parents were self-employed. Many of my father's relatives were self-employed and they were very scared that if um, people found out that my father had a child who had a sickness of the brain, would they want to do business with my father? So there was a lot of um, a lot of the fear and stigmatization, stigmatization that came along with my illness crept into my parents' life. And I could tell it really had my father, especially in times when they were trying to grow and build their business and I was very sick, trying to keep some level of balance was very difficult for him. And it did um, at times result in a lot of fight fighting between my parents' families on who was taking the right approach to help me in what way. So that's why when um, families deal with chronic illness, not just epilepsy, but many, it really can have an impact on the whole family structure. So the biggest thing I can say with um, having epilepsy is my seizures now are controlled. But the hardest thing to really have um, been able to get a hold of has been my emotional and mental health due to the impact that um, where my head trauma is, but also life experiences of battling a neurological disorder. So when I was younger, about 2008, I was diagnosed with um, PTSD, and I have shown signs of other neurodivergent conditions like ADHD and autism but I've never been diagnosed with anything I've been able to find when it comes to things like test taking and other um, repetitive skills that I enjoy, finding a structured system so I can do what I need to do. But the hardest years for me, I have to say, and this is true for a lot of um, children who deal with chronic illness, teenage years are the hardest years because you're dealing with hormones, you're dealing with changes, you're dealing with a great deal of... Um, development of the body. And I found that um, twice in my life, I tried to attempt suicide because of the um, 
side effects of the meds I was on the time. It was just too much for me to handle, but I did not want my parents to know how much I was hurting, which was the biggest mistake I should have told them instead of taking, allowing myself to sink to the level I did and taking the actions that I did. My um, family really did not know how to handle it when the doctor told them what I did. And it really led sadly to um, a lot of toxicity between um, my father and I, because he just couldn't grasp the concept, concept of why would I do something like this to me? But despite the, um, challenges I was dealing with at that time, you know, even though I wasn't very sociable due to epilepsy, some of the friends I had in um, school were very loving and supportive, and I was very lucky to have them in my life, and in fact, many of them, this was my, um, this picture here is my friend Tony, and him and I went to the prom together. Tony and I are still in touch, and we still support each other with everything in life, which is I'm very grateful that I can say I have a handful of friends like those who, no matter how hard it gets, I know I can send a message or pick up the phone. And I know that other person on the other end really understands what I've gone through and can relate with me. So when I finished high school, it took me a couple of years to decide what I really wanted to do. When I first left high school, I felt very lost as a human being. And a lot of this really led to and why I'm so passionate of working with children with disabilities is going through the K-12 system. They really don't have um, goals for children with disabilities. You have the IDEA Act, you have FAPE in place, they have the right to their education. However, with the stigmas that disabilities have once you reach adulthood, they really have not done what they need to, to transition students to go from high school really into a productive workforce or going into higher education. I find the biggest concern I have found in this, my own experience, is leaving high school and going to college and you lose those um, protections that you have from the FAPE, from FAPE and IDEA Act, you still have the American with Disabilities Act to protect you. But the universities really do not have to um, abide to all those rules that K-12 system does. So you have people with disabilities going into college wanting to better themselves and you face a lot of discrimination going into the higher education system. I had a seizure my last semester of college when I did my bachelor's and when I recovered and went back to school, of all people, the disability director called me to her office put her hand on my hand when we were sitting talking and went, honey, not everyone is college material. And I pulled my hand away from her and I went, well, guess what, honey, I am. And I'm walking across that stage in May. And I thought to myself, this is just a time we're transitioning. At that point, the Disability Act had been, it was put into place in 1990s. So I thought, okay, 10 plus years, that's not great but we'll progress and move forward. Working, at, working with the University of Redlands and they recently made a disability group for students there. I had students telling me the same frustrating stories of hearing people who were there to advocate for them, telling them, you know, you're really not college material. I don't know why you're here. And to hear that 20 years later, it really, um, it was a kick to the gut that things like this still take place in our society. And just going on, I made up my mind, no matter what happened, I was going to do the best I could with what I have. When I think the hardest thing for me, where I think I feel at times still, and I shouldn't, but I feel where I feel incomplete is, my passion was to be an attorney. And in my last year of my bachelor's, my doctor made a change to my medication and I was driving and had a seizure without warning, which had never happened before. And I crashed my car. And my goal went from finishing up my last year, taking my LSAT and applying to law school to, okay, how am I just going to stay alive and get what I need to go? And I think a lot of people don't realize how easily a condition like epilepsy can change somebody's life and have such an impact 
on their um on their life goals. But um, I have to say, despite those conflicts, the one thing that really has helped me come together and move forward was when I became friends with my husband, Tobias, who was in the picture with me there. And when I first met Tobias, I was um, really scared to tell him. I mean, really, really scared to um, tell Tobias that I um, had seizures thinking I would lose everything we were going to have together. But I realized as I fell in love with them, this was not something I could hide from him. And when I finally told Tobias about my condition, he said, well, I guess it's something we're going to have to deal with together. And that's when I knew I had found my future husband. But many people with epilepsy keep their condition a secret due to um, many employers will actually refuse to hire you if you have epilepsy. By law with the American with Disabilities Act, they're not allowed to say out loud, oh, I can't hire you because of this. They could be sued. But a lot of people who um, will put on their documents that they're disabled will get looked over or by law some places they have to interview them. And then they will decide either, okay, we don't hire them or we give them a position where they're out of sight, out of mind. We don't have to worry about clients seeing them, which is... Um, very hard. So what I did for many years, having to be as a single woman taking care of myself, I had my neurologist write a letter saying I had migraines because migraines triggered my seizures. So I let my, um, my boss know if I have a migraine, sorry, I just can't come into work that day. And it was really as terrible of a lie it was in a way. It was the only thing that helped me to get gainful employment. I had to hide what I was truly dealing with in life in order to put a roof over my head, put clothes on all the basic necessities that a lot of people can um, go to work and not feel, you know, scared. But for me, it was um, a lot of times I felt a lot of fear because I thought, what if the one person I don't want to know ever finds out and I lose my job and then I lose my apartment and I lose my car and I lose everything. Because with the cost of health care, my meds at that time when I was single, out of pocket would have been $1,000 a month. I was making about $1,500 a month. How was I going to survive? I wasn't. And I was making too much to get any type of um, federal or state assistance. So I had to remain silent and do what I could to make sure others didn't learn about my condition. Now that I've gotten older... I've just made up the um, my mind that I feel I don't want to hide who I am anymore. And I know there's pros and cons to it. After graduating, I had a number of companies look at my LinkedIn profile, and the moment they saw I was an epilepsy advocate, moved right along. So I know that I probably lost the opportunity of some good jobs by making the decision to be self-employed and fight for what I feel is right. But I feel at the same time that um, I shouldn't have to hide who I am or feel ashamed. I shouldn't have to feel I must go on SSI or SSDI to prove, you know, to remain away from others. I feel um, I, I need to be a strong, independent woman. I need to set an example for my family, for my children, and show that despite um, not getting dealt the best hand in life, there's no excuse not to live my life to the fullest. There's no excuse not to do something productive with my life despite having a neurological disorder. And so Tobias and I got married in 2006 and it was very special to me because it was something I really never thought would happen. I never thought that, I mean, you know, with the um, level that um, epilepsy can have on your, your identity, your self-esteem, making you feel isolated, a lot of people feel they're not going to find that lucky, that other one. They're not going to be lucky to find that significant other. And I felt that way for a long time. So it was, you know, especially um, very important for me when, when um, I committed myself and we became married. And for in, in history, I can't remember how far back, people with epilepsy were allowed to be institutionalized to the 1970s. But even around that time and some back, 
if you had epilepsy, you were not allowed to get married and you were not allowed to have children in some cultures. So the fact that I could have a husband and start a family, it was uh, when I know so many were denied that opportunity, it really meant a lot to me. And these are my boys. My son, the one giving the thumbs up, that's my son, Edward. He just turned 10 a couple of days ago. And then my little guy there, that's my son, you know, Anthony. And I really, um, I thank my, my doc, neurologist at the time and my OBGYN for really believing that I had the capability to have my sons and be a good mother. The one thing I find that is very important that we don't always get um, help with when, as women is the importance of understanding um, prenatal, postnatal care and everything. And for me, I made sure to plan my pregnancies. I asked a lot of questions. I did a lot of research because one of the biggest frustrations I've had as a woman helping other women with epilepsy is many really do not understand the importance of preparing their bodies for pregnancy, having the right vitamins, having the right care, making sure that they are ready so that they will have um, a healthy child. And to, to me, I feel it's, there's no excuse in the 21st century for doctors not to be more forthcoming in helping their patients. This shouldn't be a situation like it is where some doctors are great, some don't want to answer. Because with creating a life, I feel it is essential for both the mother and child, for everyone to be on board and to give um, 100%. The one thing that I did to help myself also in preparing, I hired a doula to be with me to help not just for myself, but my husband for support while I was laboring. And I feel that um, it's something, it shouldn't be having a doula there, isn't, shouldn't be a luxury for mothers who are about to give birth. I feel it's something that our healthcare system, no matter what you're on, um, your health condition is, is something that should be offered to the mother because I can say having my doula with me the two times I was um, I gave birth. It was very comforting to know that I had someone there when I felt overwhelmed was there for me or if my husband needed guidance as I was laboring was also there for the him. So if anything, that's something I really find as I work into the future, I really want to focus on is more... Um, resources for mothers as they're um, going through pregnancy and birth, but especially for mothers who um, have chronic illnesses. But with my life experiences, I was told when I was younger, I wasn't going to live. So living past my teenage years, I already overcame a very big goal. And I made up my mind that I was going to do everything I could to experience life and live it to a fullest rather than going along with the system of being in a group home or some type of assistant living. And I've been very blessed to have done a lot of traveling and had a lot of experience that many people with epilepsy do not get the experience to have. The picture I have here when I was in um, doing my master's, I won a leadership grant through the University of Redlands. And I went over with um, the business school to South Africa. And we had the honor of going to the parliament and being one of the parliament members. And outside of the um, parliament building were these steps with the different letters or different words, I'm sorry. And it, I just found it so um, touching to see working up towards the things we need to in the government and society. And um, a friend of mine who was my pen pal, we've been friends for over 30 years. She was from South Africa and actually lived there during the time of the um, apartheid government. So to see how far they were trying to get and they still have so much further to go, I found it very touching to see this display to show the steps they were taking to um, make the society a better place. And then when it comes to my personal challenges with epilepsy, my last complex partial seizure when I lost um, consciousness was in February 2004. And despite now being my seizures being controlled, I still have um, a lot of side effects plus the, um, the PTSD, which I think if I had to choose between the epilepsy and PTSD, PTSD is something very, very um, 
difficult to live with. And I feel it's for all people, we need to start getting more involved in helping people with PTSD and finding more resources for them because it can be um, very debilitating. So despite having my seizures under control, I still have to do um, routine tests every so often to see if you know anything has changed. In the picture here, I was having what was called an ambulatory EEG. And what they do is they put um, the electrodes on your head and depending on where it is, they're picking up different brain waves. So depending on what you're doing in the day, how you're sleeping at night or everything, they're watching the continuous brain waves and seeing if they can pick up any um, overactivity. So the time that I did this, because I, my seizures had been controlled for so long, I was hoping that um, they had completely stopped and that I could come off medication, but they found um, despite being on medicine and not having any breakthrough seizures that there was still overactivity in my um, brain taking place. So as hard as it was to realize that coming off my meds isn't an option, I'm going to be, this is going to be part of my life. At the same time, it was very nice to um, be able to get some answers and find some closure with it. And so even though epilepsy has been around the beginning of time, there are many people in society who really don't even know or understand what epilepsy is or that it even exists. And that is why we see the level of discrimination in the workforce, our healthcare system, relationships, and other situations that can impair somebody who has epilepsy and decrease their quality of life. And I strongly feel that the education is essential, not just for people with um, epilepsy, but society in general. And the reason for that is, is not just um, epilepsy itself, but disabilities in general, when we stigmatize people, we're not just hurting ourselves, we hurt everyone. And I was talking to a group of entrepreneurs about that one time because they were wondering, they were fear, fearful to hire people with disabilities. They were worried about if something happened, they'd be held liable. And I explained a number of ways, such as um, working from home, working in secure environments, other ways they could bring um, people with disability on into their workforce. And I said to them in regards of, in regards of epilepsy, I said, there's 3.4 million people uh, in our country with epilepsy, 70% control their seizures, but so many of them end up in disability because of the stress of trying to get proper care, trying to get gainful employment. I said a lot of them end up giving up and going on disability. I said, now can you imagine if we all work together to remove the stigma and the 70% of the 3.4 million rather on disability, they're in the workforce. Instead of paying tax dollars to keep them in homes, they're paying their tax dollars by working and contributing to communities. I go think of the economic growth that would cause the positive impact it would have on communities, on our neighborhoods, our society, and it's the light went off. So many more like, I never thought of it that way. And I said, no, we don't, until we step into somebody's shoes and truly sees what, see what it's like to have a disability. So many people don't realize that. I read an article that um, Susan Rice wrote earlier in the year, it was in CNN. And it was an organization she did some research with. And they stated that if 1% of the disability community here in the United States was put to work, we could generate $25 billion for our GDP just by putting 1% to work. So it shows how much um, when we try to stop others from living to the fullest, how much we, we hurt each other overall. In the earliest of times, many people were thought to be gifted who had epilepsy and were cared for. Early stories in the Bible mention epilepsy, and despite being thought that they were being taken over by demons, there is a scripture about Jesus helping a young boy with epilepsy to be freed from his demon and helping ending the seizure. So in the earlier stages in you know areas of um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, there are stories of 
epilepsy and they were being shown compassion despite being considered tortured by these demons. But as the dark ages came in, treatment towards people who had epilepsy changed. And for example, the Catholic Church started to perform exorcism on people who had epilepsy and many of them were severely hurt or even killed due to multiple exorcisms. So historical figures such as Jonah Ark, Muhammad, and Joseph Smith were thought to have had epilepsy. A uh, neurologist that I work with did an article on this recently. If you would like a copy of it, I'll send it. And it was really interesting. And he talked about um, visual and auditorial hallucinations that take place in the temporal lobe when people have seizures. And when they described the stories of um, that Jonah Ark, Muhammad, and Joseph, Joseph Smith gave when they had their connections with God, a lot of doctors, they don't have the evidence, but many a times feel that epilepsy may have been involved in this, which it's really interesting about it. Joan of Arc, she was burnt at the stake for her auditorial visual hallucinations for connecting to God, and many epileptologists and other researchers now believe she had what was called ecstatic epilepsy. And what a static epilepsy is, these are people when they're having a seizure, suddenly feel a high level of happiness. It's a divine feeling before they lose consciousness. And it was interesting, they've done um, studies on these patients and the biggest challenges the doctors have, these are the patients who actually don't wanna comply with treatment because they feel such a hap happiness before going to a seizure, they don't want to deal with the side effects of the medication. They rather have the seizure. I wish it was that easy from, from my experience, but it's, it just shows the complexity of the brain. Mine is the total opposite. I become very frightened before I have a seizure. But from the dark ages throughout most of the 20th century, people who had epilepsy, they were abused so um, society. Many were f forced to be sterilized. They couldn't get married. Families um, disowned them. And then during the Second World War, many were captured by Nazis and taken to Northern Germany where they were experimented on. And the goal was to remove epilepsy and other neurological disorders from the gene pool. And they had um, a sterilization campaign because they looked at neurological disorders as um, mental defectives. So the goal was to try to find a way to manipulate the genes so that they could not find a cure of epilepsy, but um, I guess you say find a way to remove it from the genetic pool so it wouldn't be part of their um, culture. So between 1931 and 1941, brains uh, were removed from victims up at the northern hospitals through starvation, gassing, or they injected them. And they sent the brains to um, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for brain research. And they continued to have many of these practices into the 1970s when doctors realized rather than institutionalizing people and treating them in this way, um, compassionate care and self-love not started to need to be brought in to the clinical setting to help people deal with their epilepsy and to help prevent further mental deterioration. And then for protections for people with epilepsy, along with the Americans with Disabilities Act, other protections have been put into place for us. And then the frustration is, is many neurological developmental disorders they're considered an invisible illness. So for example, most people when they come up and they talk to me, don't even know that I have a life-threatening condition. They wouldn't see me as sick. A lot of the times when it's noticed is when it's a very severe case and there's no way of hiding it. So things like education, employment, and healthcare, they're three of the most challenging areas for people who are battling epilepsy. For children in the um, healthcare system, there are a variety of tools that are legally available for not just kids with epilepsy, but disabilities in general. 
The 504 is a federal law that focuses on ensuring that schools provide children with disabilities or impairments the services and accommodations necessary in order to access everything that other children can assess at school, including curriculum. My sons are both, under, or my oldest son is under a 504 for having hemophilia A. And really what's put in place for this is he's doing very well on his treatment. But if something were to happen and he had to go to the hospital for a couple of days, they cannot hold that absence against my son. And if he's going to be in the hospital for extended time, he has the right to get his, his um, assignments from his teacher and the principal and take them up there and do his work so that he gets credit. So it's, it is a shield of protection so that kids who are dealing with medical conditions they have that protection and cannot have um, the absences and other situations held against them. An IEP or an individualized education plan, it goes a little further. It's a plan on how to help a child with a qualifying disability be um, provided what's known as FAPE, which is free appropriate public education to ensure that they can make meaning, meaningful educational progress. It can be anything from simple as my youngest is under an IEP. He has the protection for his hemophilia, but he also teach, teaches on um, take speech. So because he's, there's more than one factor coming into play, that's when they'll put an IEP in place. Another situation where um, IEPs can get expanded is for things like um, home hospital programs. When my son had surgery, my one son had surgery years ago, one of the little boys he shared a room with was battling um, leukemia and he had a home hospital plan put in place. So even though he was in the hospital going through treatment, they still sent um, a tutor to the hospital daily to be with him, to help him with his schoolwork so that he could stay up with his um, students or his classmates and not fall behind um, from what he had to do. And FAPE is known as, um, like I said, free appropriate public education. And for a 504 or IEP to meet FAPE requirements, it must be an individualized plan to meet the student's needs and be appropriate to help them meet, make the progress that they need. A seizure action plan, and this is something I encourage you all to, um, to learn about. It's a layout of information in the event someone has a seizure. So anyone who is battling epilepsy or has a loved one who is battling epilepsy, I can't stress enough how important it is to have one of these. And the reason I stress it is the fact that everyone has different seizures. When people think of seizures, they think of tonic-clonic. They think of people falling on the ground, stiffening and shaking. There are so many different types of seizures. People may stare blankly, they may scream, they can do a lot of different things. When I have complex partial seizures, I come off as drunk. I'll mumble, I'll stutter, I might start pacing around. I appear like I'm conscious, like I'm there, but I have no idea what I've done. I have no idea what's going on at the point. I've blacked out. And what's scary about situations like that and why education and materials like this are so important, a lot of times people who have seizures end up getting arrested while they're seizing in situations like mine because law enforcement will get called to the area. They're not doctors. They're not therapists. They're trying to get a person to comply and follow their order. But if you're having a seizure, you can't comply. And because the lack of education and law enforcement when it comes to epilepsy, a lot of people I know have regained consciousness in a jail cell rather than being taken to a hospital and receiving care like they should have. So I can't stress enough to people to fill these out if they have a loved one or they have it, give it to, you know, keep one in their car, keep one in the house, keep one for whenever in their purse somewhere. So if something happens, there's the information for the EMT or the fire department. And I've given the link on um, where you can find them. 
on the Epilepsy Foundation of America site. And if you would like the link, please let me know and I'm happy to um, send it to all of you. But a lot of times when people have seizures in public, so many people are so scared because they either have never seen one or it just happened so fast, they don't know what to do. And so having the education and the resources together in a situation like that, it truly is um, essential. And then the one thing that I do talk to people about is the difference between SSI and SSDI, because I find a lot of people when they are in situations where they're sick to the point where they really can't work anymore, don't understand the difference between the two. The one thing that I, I'm finding more and more out here is I do more research. I um, came in contact with an organization that helps people with all disabilities. And one thing they offer in Pasadena is they give courses on how to apply for SSI. And they have uh, attorneys there who work pro bono to help these people. Because the biggest thing years ago when I got sick, uh, when they were like, well, are you going to apply? I honestly didn't know what to apply for. Was I applying for SSI? I was lost. And when you don't have an attorney, that makes it even worse because Social Security is not going to hold your hand through this and explain everything. It's fill out the paperwork I have work to do. So no understanding the difference between the two and being able to find resources in the nonprofit sector and other organizations I find is so important because there are so many people who end up falling through the cracks, who truly need help because they don't understand what they're applying for or what they can, um, as a citizen, get being in the situation they are. So when it comes to advocacy work, advocacy involves promoting the interested or cause of somebody or a group of people and I have found the hardest thing in doing any type of advocacy work is not so much um, advocating for others, but getting other people to um, practice self-advocacy, speaking for themselves, understanding their strengths, their weaknesses, their goals, their legal rights, responsibilities, and getting involved. For example, I had something recently happen to me that a lot of people were um, shocked how I reacted. I went to USC, I had to have another ambulatory EEG. And when I arrived up at um, USC to the uh, neurology department, the EEG techs handed me a document and the document stated that when I returned the machine, if there was something faulty with it and USC solely um, declared that it happened while I had the machine, that by signing the document, I would agree to let USC build me $23,000 to replace the machine. Common sense, <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> I was like, absolutely not. Will I ever sign such a thing? And they couldn't understand why I was upset. And I said, well, one, is the machine insured? They wouldn't give me an answer. All I, had to, all I kept hearing was, I'm following protocol. I said, well, what happens if a patient goes home, they have a seizure and fall, and the machine gets damaged during the seizure? Are you going to build them? 23,000, yeah. They would not give me that answer. And I literally got denied treatment because I refused to sign this document. And it just upset me because I can't tell you how many people, the EEG tech goes, well, people sign it all the time. I don't know why you're upset. They sign it all the time. I go, I just explained to you. I go, would you sign it? And he goes, oh, no. I said, what do you think I'm going to sign it then if you wouldn't sign it yourself if you were in my shoes? I said, the average person on SSI brings in about 15000 a year. I go, how can you expect them to pay $23,000? It's not going to happen. You're going to send it collections and destroy their credit. And it just shows um, when I spoke out about this, and in fact, I wrote an article about it, and really I dove into the kind of funding USC brings in, the funding that the Epilepsy Foundation of America gave them, and a lot of people were like, how could you do that? Do you know how people, many people you probably angered? And I'm thinking, I'm not worried about some CEO's feelings. 
I'm worried about my community not being able to get care because the system stacked against them. And too many people are too afraid to take that step that I took, pushing the contract back going, no, I deserve better. You will not put me at financial risk for your own gain. And I find that um, getting people to that point, to be just being able to help them get the strength to have that voice, it's very, very hard for them. But I, I encourage people such as informal individuals, such as friends, caregivers, to learn organizations, learn and help people, no matter what passion you have. If you see people who are suffering from something, I feel we, one person can't change the world. I mean, myself as an advocate, there's 65 million people with epilepsy. I can, I can talk to the cows come home. If it's just me, no one's going to care. It takes coming together for people to see that change needs to happen. And that's really my goal in the work I'm doing is to bring many people together to see that there is no reason for others to fear people with epilepsy. There's no reason for other, um, how can I put it? There's no reason for the toxicity, the discrimination, the dis and the stigma that are placed on so many um, disabilities and different conditions. So in concluding that, you know, epilepsy is a neurological disorder resulting in someone having seizures. There's many different types of epilepsy and seizures affecting each one differently. Despite having epilepsy, many individuals who have epilepsy can be productive like any able-bodied individual. It's going to be essential that we educate others to reduce the stigma that is associated with epilepsy. And it is important to understand your rights and to advocate for yourself when you're battling epilepsy. And there's my resources. And I hope you, I hope you enjoyed any, everything. Are there any questions I can answer? Thank you. Natalie, we said that we were focusing in these few months on overcoming challenges. We could not possibly have had a better example than you to talk about overcoming challenges. Thank you. And truly, I congratulate you. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. You all, mu you. You all must have things to say. Well, I've had an experience for the last, I would say, almost eight years with a gentleman who actually grew up down the street from me. He had epilepsy, I found out years later, when he was a very little child. He had a mother that was, she had, I don't know what it was, but she wasn't like a real adult. She was, in her mind, she was a lot younger. But he had a father that worked. So he spoke spoke only Spanish. And anyway, he got to know the boys across the street. He grew up on the street. And while everybody else, what, he was going to school. He had an accident when he was like 18. And everybody else kept going. All of his friends kept going and kind of went on with their life. And his life didn't keep going. He got a job. He managed his job. Then he got into alcohol and drugs and he was not treated for his epilepsy. So for probably the next 13 years, he was not treated. And my theory is he probably had many grand mal seizures because sometimes he'd get picked up at the park and taken to the hospital. And anyway, he was gone a long time. And he showed up here about almost eight years ago. And I don't know what I was doing, but I knew that this, I knew the person. I knew that basically it was a good person. Yeah, it was manners. He wouldn't even dream of using bad language in front of me. You know, he was a good person. He's now 62. And so I just started following whatever my head god whatever and managed to 
get him a, a medical doctor and um, the head doctor, the psych doctor, and the people at um, San Bernardino County Health Department or um, Mental Health Department were the most helpful. Oh, awesome. And I met a, managed to find a, um, what do you call it, like a social worker within there. And they helped with Social Security because we'd already tried five times. Oh, yeah. A lot of times people try on average three to five times. It could take years. That's yeah. why a lot of people finally give in and hire an attorney because the paperwork is horrible. Yeah. So he just walked in. You might have seen him come in and walk behind me to come in and get his medication. So he lives in my garage. Has a, a cow, uh, you know, an area there in the garage. And he's super happy because he has four walls and he feels secure and safe. And uh, he has a bit of a life in the community here. He helps out sometimes. They give away food at the park that's close by. And he helps them. It's, he loves to work. He, I don't think he could keep a job because not only has he the seizures, which are maintained, they're mm -hmm. controlled, but he also they diagnosed him with schizophrenia. So if yeah. you don't know him, if you don't know him, Sometimes you don't know what he's talking about. But if you know him, like I could pick pieces out that he's talking about maybe 30 years ago. Or maybe it was yesterday. That's one of the challenging things is there are a number of health conditions that are associated with epilepsy mm -hmm. and schizophrenia is one of them. I've been trying to put together a paper and presentation on schizophrenia and epilepsy for my YouTube channel. And one of the hardest things I actually put it down and gave a little bit, bit of a break before finishing it is the research for it goes through phases. In the 80s, they were really starting to get into it. It tapered off for a good 15 years. They started digging through it again and then just backed away from it again. So the hardest thing I've had is I try to find the most recent um, information I can about the two of them together. And a lot of it is before the 2000s. There's a lot of stuff that we need to know about that um, because there's a, such a lack of funding for the research, hmm. it's not happening. But these different, um, he's even been, diagnosed by the, the, the mental health with uh, depression, but you can't see it if you don't know the signs, because sometimes somebody can seemingly be depressed and be happy all the time. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. not, you know. Because yeah. I battle depression, and yeah. that's the same thing. There's times people can look at you and go, oh, you're, you're not depressed. You don't know what it's like right. to be depressed. And no, it's, it's not the case. And a lot of times certain things trigger, it's not a consistent level of depression, but certain experiences or certain little things can trigger it to happen. Right. So here we are. Yes. Kitty, are you waving goodbye or do you have a comment? Well, I, I sent you a message. I wanted to thank oh. Natalie so much. I have a cousin who's the same age as me and we've, she's had epilepsy her whole life. And I'm so glad, so grateful to you to have given me more information and things that I could share with her that she can share with her children. And this has just been an absolute miracle to me to hear all this. And thank you so much, all of you. I wish I could stay, but I can't. So thank you again and hope to see you next time. See you next time, yes. Kitty. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Kitty. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Any other comments? Diane, yeah, Sohila? I got, yeah. Lila? I got us. I got us real quick. My daughter's um, almost here. Um, Natalie, wow. <laughs> my, my, my youngest grandson um, was a difficult child. He doesn't have epi epilepsy that I know of. Um, um, but uh, we finally... Uh, made connection with him, uh, with Emily, Emily Shum, you know her? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he was diagnosed with um, ADHD, Tourette's, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And oh, he's wow. also, uh, um, he doesn't have a, a, a imp impulse control. 
So um, he is, he has a 504 and I think an IEP and he has um, just, uh, he's in the seventh grade now. Yeah. And his parents are right on top. I'm right on top with the school and everything. And it's wonderful the way the school has embraced him. Oh, the, awesome. Uh, administration. But I'm so happy that you talked about when he goes to college. Because yes. that's something. And I'm definitely going to sit down and share um, your presentation with my daughter and, and son-in-law. Um, so. And if, if any time any school gives him a hard time, there's more and more evidence out there to show the potential that people with neurodiversity has. I can send it to you. I have your email, I can send it to you, or okay. I could send it to the um, the women on the move um, email so you all see it. There was an article in the Harvard Business Review about four years ago, and they showed in studies that people who are neurodivergent are really good at jobs that um, are repetitive, mm -hmm. or they, they have higher IQs. There's a lot of things they can do that they don't get credit for. And the HR departments and a lot of these bigger companies like Microsoft, JP Morgan Chase, HP, have started to see that, okay, they may act a little differently than us, but they're smart. And we put them in the right environment, they can make money for us. Mm -hmm. And they just show <clears throat> how much this, it adds to the companies because not only are they making revenue, but they're diversifying their teams now. And it shows that they're changing with the times and being a much more accepting company. That's one of, he's very much, very, very tech. I mean, um, um, oriented and he loves video games and stuff like that. He can sit and he uh, do a, 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 a Lego, uh -huh. build a whole Lego thing in like a, a half an hour or, and he's just super focused and super, and I just, it, I just look at it, it gives me the creeps. <laughs> I can't get the one of those little pieces. Yes. Um, so he's, he's, he's getting at right now straight A's. Oh, that's awesome. I'm not surprised one bit. He yeah. just, he needs a, that's wonderful that the school is right mm -hmm. on board all with you and with the right love and support and guidance and tools he needs. There's no reason he can't succeed. Oh, I, I know there's not. Yeah. 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 So, and definitely, definitely, I'm going to talk to Joanna. I'm going to talk to everybody at Healthy RC. You have got to do this for the, uh, for one of the mental health uh, forums coming up. Oh, this, wonderful. People, people need to hear this information. Yeah. yeah. So, Andrea, are you raising your hand? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I want to share my thoughts on just your presentation, Natalie. That was just so heartwarming, so incredibly educational and, and such a self-advocate, right? I think on the perspective of a mom, myself, just understanding everything that, that is an IEP, that is a 504, and then pushing that advocacy for your children is so important. And the fact that you have all this information just now available to the public, right? Now that we can share this presentation, um, I know for me, it was incredibly inspirational. And I just want to amend you and command you for everything that you've done and all you've accomplished. And an incredibly talented person, I, I will definitely follow you and everything that you you share, your YouTube channel, and just learn a lot more, everything that you have to provide. Oh, Thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay, so Hela, and I think Zebu too, wanted to say, but so Hela. Thank you, Natalie. This is really an honor for us to have had you share this information. And just coming from the point of not just enlightening us about your story and your life and what you dad did, but enlightening us about how the humanity is, is having an epiphany that requires all of us to be participating in. You yes. put the name of advocates to shame when when you are telling us how much single-handedly you're doing, because you're going above the law, you're going beyond the law. And this shows us how deficient our legal systems and our laws that are oh, old yeah. and ancient and need to be revisited, how much of that information you're bringing to light? How much of the fact that, that every single person needs to be an advocate and, and also showing how much of an integrated system needs to happen and needs to work towards everything that is important in this life and in this society 
However, you know, the neurological impairments are one of the, it, it's basically the first cause of suicidal and, and, and killing and losing our resources, our brains yeah. um, to, to that disease. And to not have research funding and to, to be resisted for anything that could be found in this area, to me, that is the mind blowing aspect of what you brought onto the surface for us. And I, again, as, a, as an advocate, I'm ashamed that I just focus on a few voiceless sections of the community of the population but then the more you look around the more you hear people like you the more we realize how deficient we individually are or even our legal system and our laws are and it really takes not just the village it takes a global effort to oh it does to put on and you also put your finger on a very sensitive point which I think um, it, it confirms what I always want to approach a problem. I say, well, I'm either approaching people with a heart. They're going to either hear me with their heart or I'm going to approach people in the pocketbook, right? Because that's yeah. another way of addressing this. And I think you addressed it from both sides so that if our lawmakers, if our rulers and decision makers don't want to look at it from their heart's perspective, if their heart is not warm with what you shared with us, the mm -hmm. pocketbooks, the fact that you mentioned those billions of dollars that could be brought to help all of us. Yes. It's really one of the motivations that I think not just you and I and maybe my cousin and my friend and my, could take on responsibility for, but our leaders and lawmakers. And you could be a great legislator. Don't even regret that you didn't become an attorney. You are <laughs> doing a whole lot more than an attorney could do. And I'll help you in any way I can. If oh, you thank you. And try to, to present things um, at a larger scale. Oh, that would be awesome. Here, let me um, put in the chat my um, email for everyone, because I would love to uh, stay in touch with everyone. Yes, yes. So you got to chase me down. There's no way okay. I would send you that email to, to write to you, but unless you, you follow through, yeah. we could get connected and we could have you inv invited to our other presentations. That would be great. Thank you, Natalie. Ziba? Are you still driving? You're, you're, you're muted, muted Ziba. Ziba. Okay. All right. Uh, I think, uh, uh, first of all, like everybody, I'm so grateful for having Natalie. Thank you so much. I can't believe all those things, word by word, that you said. I relate to that because most people here, they know about my life and my son's life. And uh, it's been just too long, so long since I've been, me and he, his father were dealing with this, uh, with his epilepsy um, problem. We've lost you, Ziba. No. Uh, hello. Okay, now we okay. hear you. Okay. Uh, the, the paying for the devices that uh, they had us sign the documents and did the payments, uh, payment by payment, to to make any procedure happening uh, was my life. And uh, most of the time, I didn't even want my son to know about it. So I relate to everything you said, and uh, my son is still having seizures, and none of the doctors could put any any name on the kind of seizures that he has. He's very bright. He's very intelligent. You talk to him, you can never guess that uh, if there was anything uh, wrong uh, with yeah. him. But and we are managing. I'm, I'm so thankful. I want to say that I'm so thankful and I'm sure I'll be in touch with you um, yes. to get help um, when I need it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank all right. You. Any other comments? Um, I think we're all just kind of blown away, Natalie, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we expected to hear... Um, 
a story that would go with our, our focus on overcoming challenges, but my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we do appreciate you opening your heart and your story to us. It has touched us all in different ways. And we will post this recording on our Women on the Move YouTube channel so that thank you other people can access it from now on. And uh, we are so grateful to you for coming to us with your presentation. And I thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I encourage all you, please keep in touch with me. Anything I can do to help any of you, I'm, I'm more than there for everyone. And if there's anyone you know who's in need, who needs help, please send them my way. Anything I can do to help make things easier for them, I can. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did, did I hear Sohaila say that um, Natalie should uh, go into uh, be a legislator? <laughs> I'll, I'll vote for her to be the president. Oh, I mean, if yeah, you know, I, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Natalie, you want to do it? You got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's so much politics in writing legislation also, but I think yeah. that would be a good start to just get the message across, get signatures going, get yeah. you know, a lot of movement. And as I said, you'll have some ears to listen to because you're talking about moving money from one aspect of, of life to another and one part of the society to another. And that will, that will be very uh, interesting people to listen to. So. Thank you. Oh, no, anything I can do to get involved in the community, I'd be interested anything to do to help others here and making a difference. Cause I just, I have found this is such a wonderful community out here and in an empire and seeing some of the limitations that they've had compared to other parts of the state. That's why I want to do what I can to help others. Cause with like, for example, the epilepsy foundation, we have four epilepsy foundation branches here in California. None of them help the Inland Empire, even uh -huh. though the Los Angeles location we're supposed to be part of greater Los Angeles. I can't tell you how many people out here didn't even know they had them to turn to or didn't, were just when they found out I existed, my organization existed, they didn't know what to do. There, there's a definite, definite discrimination with the area that we live in. My husband had Parkinson's and um, I'm, well, the horror stories I went through with him and insurance and, 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 and because we lived in the San Bernardino County, um, we were considered less than, he was considered less than um, for receiving benefits than those who lived in LA County. Oh, that's awful. It just, oh. it was, it was sickening. Yeah, it is. We know some women lawmakers who have come from this area and they're really, mm -hmm. um, you know, cheering for this county. And I think if you don't mind, um, you know, we have another nonprofit organization that Andrea has been helping me with. And we would just promote and just, you know, showcase what you do on uh -huh. our websites everywhere. Yeah, and oh, that would be great. Absolutely. Stuff out on social media. And I'm speaking on behalf of Andrea, knowing that, knowing her heart, knowing her golden heart, that she would put as much effort as she can to, to really rally your cause with you. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, so um, this is not the end. I mean, this yes. is the end. No, no, this is, this is <laughs> but the beginning. This is not the end of our relationship with you, Natalie. No, no. And yes. so we hope that you will continue to um, uh, collaborate with our organization and we will continue to support your efforts in, in any way we can. And oh, thank um, you. We will let everybody know. Um, about this presentation and uh, when it goes up. Uh, um, Andrea will have it up on our YouTube pretty soon in a, just like a few days. Oh, wonderful. And then, yeah, please, I would love to attend your monthly event. So I know you had sent me one, but you know, I would love to stay in touch and see what other um, organizations are coming on or other people you're working with. Yeah, next month we have someone that you may have met. She's um, been a part of Healthy RC as well. Mm -hmm. And um, she, he, he, again, it's going to be on overcoming challenges. So certainly, yes, we hope you will join us then and yes. in the future as well. And then um, it, on December 11th, um, we are hosting 
a really spiffy uh, <laughs> concert fundraiser big event. Oh, nice. <laughs> On Zoom, unfortunately. <laughs> it's going to be on Zoom, unfortunately. We, will, we won't be able to have our usual costume gala that we used to have uh, in past years for a fundraiser. But um, on December 11th, we will be um, doing this. And we hope that you will log in. We hope that you will help us spread the word. And, oh, absolutely. Um, we are doing our, our flagship program, which is an after-school program for girls. Um, we're having to do it on Zoom, and so we're making all kinds of changes, but we we need to be serving our little girls to help, oh, absolutely. Them, help them grow up to become women on the move. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think Natalie could speak to the older girls um, because, you know, she went through this as a teenager. The, the yeah. 12, 12 to 14 year olds, she, she could, you could speak to. Speak we do to have uh, one group already of middle schoolers and another one coming on board in January. Yeah. And uh, I think it would be appropriate if you uh, are uh, in agreement to oh, absolutely. A, a version of this that's appropriate for 12 to 14 year olds. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll make sure that that happens. Perfect. No, I'm excited because I find even now I was telling um, a number of people, a number of my friends that here we are in the 21st century and we're still as women trying to fight for that voice. And it's like, I refuse to be silent anymore. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh yeah. No, 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 no. And if you go, <laughs> speaking of being silent, if you go on our YouTube, you will find the previous thing that we did last year called mm -hmm. Hushed Wisdom. Hushed and Wisdom. It, yeah, and it's a whole big program focusing on the hushed voices of women down through the years. Oh, and wow. celebrating those women who speak out. And we, have, we had some really heavy hitter women making yeah. presentations on that uh, thing. So I think okay. you will enjoy it. Oh, definitely. I'll check okay, it out for right. sure. Yeah. You know, just make a whole weekend of it. Just buy popcorn and just lay out and just lay on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> all weekend long, you know? <laughs> and Andrea, can you send the, the flyer for the, the, um, for the December 11th um, through, the, through the emails? Because there are people I want to invite and share oh. it with. Please. I'm sorry I didn't do that. But um, I think we need a little bio from Natalie also, so that Andrew could just maybe showcase her. her oh, okay. we, we do. We yeah. do have. She did send us a little bio uh, to prepare for this. So Andrea has that. And her websites and everything, so that we yeah. can do it through showcasing. Yeah. Okay. I have to. I have to go. I have to go off. Love well, you. I think we all Love have to all. go. It's it's six twenty now. Yeah. All women on the move. So we're all yes, that's right. All yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but again, thank and I'm you. home, and I'm yeah. home finally. Yeah, good, oh, good. Good. <laughs> Safe and sound. May I share just the good news? Mila had to leave and said uh, goodbye to everyone, but she only had to leave because she was receiving an email saying she had passed the bar. Very good. Very oh, good. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. That's excellent. Ooh. So and I and passed the wonderful. state exam. Just okay. Just, you know, I passed my state exam. I got the results. Good. Okay, okay <laughs> great. Too. Good All for right. you. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Well, ladies, good have a good weekend. Yep. Uh, we will see you yes, at various soon. times and certainly at our next Women's Empowerment Workshop. Absolutely. Oh, okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.